It is an honor to welcome Dr. Janine Weddell to our commencement service this year. Janine graduated from Bethel College in 1978, and some of her professional accomplishments are outlined in the program. As an anthropologist and professor, Janine is also an author. Her last book won the prestigious Graumeyer Award for Ideas Improving World Order. Janine is currently finishing the manuscript for her next book, titled Shadow Elite, The Privatization of Power. Janine's passion for improving the world and her interest in public policy were nurtured as she grew up. Her mother describes how she became lifelong friends with persons from much different backgrounds than hers already in grade school. Janine volunteered for several summers in high school in Clinton, Oklahoma, working with Native Americans in those communities. As a teenager, she listened to the Watergate hearings and composed two songs, including the Watergate Blues. Her interest in Eastern Europe was strengthened as an exchange student living in Marburg, Germany, during which time she was part of a small study group that went to Poland to learn about the concentration camps. Janine has since lived in Poland and even taught a university course in Polish. She has been a student of her surroundings at Bethel, in Germany, in Poland, and in Washington, D.C. I don't know whether this has guided her analysis of public policy, but her mother says that her favorite children's story was Three Billy Goats Gruff. Janine is the daughter of Bethel College Professor Emeritus of Mathematical Sciences, Arnold M. Wedel and Dolores Wedel of North Newton, a point I make partly to clarify that Janine now pronounces her last name Wedel. She assures me that she will not be offended either way. At the alumni banquet last evening, we learned about some creative activities, sometimes called pranks, in Bethel's history. The creativity of our students comes out in unique ways sometimes. When Janine sent us the title of her remarks and then said that she intends to draw a link between pranks and life in her address today, I wondered, wondered whether we might be hearing some confessions this afternoon. We'll have to listen together to find out. And so it is with great pleasure that I welcome back to Bethel College Dr. Janine Weddell to present the address to this gathered community on serious fun. Dr. Weddell. Well, I'm not planning to sing the Watergate blues for you, but perhaps I should. I think there are probably still about 500 copies of the record somewhere in the basement. <laughs> anyway, as I was thinking about how to approach this address this afternoon, I got an email message on how to give a speech. It said, and I quote, Good speakers inspire and motivate audience members to do such things as wear hard hats more often, meet sales quotas, give better customer service, or clean up trash in the office lunchroom. Your primary responsibility as a good speaker is to inspire. If you can't even get inspired to do this, then don't give a speech. Send an email instead. Taking that advice to heart, I'm sending you all emails. But seriously, I'm so honored to be back at Bethel and to address you on the occasion of your commencement. And thank you so much for that very generous inter uh, introduction. In the 30 years since I graduated from Bethel, I was 12 at the time, of course, I've come to appreciate what a good educational foundation I got here. I majored in history and the social sciences and German. And, what, and while I studied hard, what I remember most is the common lore of the college, Bethel's shared stories, if you will. These stories include a long history of, of pranks. And of course, we um, at the alumni banquet last night heard some of this, some of this legacy. Cows have been known to visit the library. No word on whether their literacy improved. Birds have been discovered under teacups. Cars have appeared on the top of buildings. 
dining hall chairs have gone missing and eventually located on the roof after weeks of us having to eat while sitting on the floor. How the pranksters got them up there remains a tightly held secret. And speaking of chairs, I understand that one generation of students learned to make the president's beloved chair disappear, although not the current president. Speaking of President Bartel, I understand that he perfected snow sliding as a means of transport down the ad building steps this past winter, after students packed the steps with snow, creating a slide. Herman Bubbert, the fictional and perennial student at Bethel, is credited with this and many other activities. I think he's even accepted responsibility for some of them. As a social anthropologist, let me reflect for a moment on the significance of pranks. They say something about the community that enacts them. Pranks require trust and a sense of belonging among members of a community. Anthropologists have even found that playing a prank on somebody can be an effort to bring him into the group. Good pranks require flexibility, creativity, daring, teamwork, and upending the natural order of things. One of the prankish activities I was involved in took place in the men's dormitory, and it won't be true confessions. I will only say that the activity involved long, uncarpeted corridors and trash cans full of soapy water. Word got out after the fact, and it seemed like I would get into trouble. What was I going to do? My father was a professor here. My sister was student body president. I was the student representative to the functional equivalent of the rules committee. As word was getting around campus, I, w I decided it would be prudent to tell my father before he heard it from others. So I did. After I mentioned to him that some of his own beloved star math students also were involved, he told me not to worry. But he said, you'd better go tell your mother. She, of course, is also part of the campus community. So I went home and broke the news to her gently. She said, well, if you were bored on Saturday night, why didn't you come home? <laughs> Today I returned to the scene of the crime. It was that experience that convinced me to go on a junior year abroad program and to take advantage of one of the many innovative learning experiences that Bethel offers. In whatever career you enter, whether academic, scientific, law, nursing, business, social work, education, fine arts, or something else, it's important to keep in mind the spirit of pranks that can bind a community together, as well as open up a wider world. It goes without saying that the world you are entering is far different from the one I beheld when I wrote my senior thesis. When I left this stage, diploma in hand, my peers and I could reasonably plot a career path. Now the only constant is change, and according to some analysts, you will be required to change careers an average of eight times. More than the great skills you have acquired here at Bethel, your success may depend on the ability to adapt and to risk doing things you couldn't foresee. The pranksters among you already know that executing the kind of prank that people will appreciate, albeit perhaps only later, requires good judgment and a sense of adventure. To recognize a potentially good prank, you have to see that rules and conventions are socially constructed and can be violated. It is that same sense of adventure in putting together the elements of a good prank and the sense of wanting to discover a wider world that first took me to Poland in the late 1970s while I was an exchange student in Germany. I had never before been behind the so-called Iron Curtain. This first trip was with a group of West German students sponsored by the German Protestant Church and recommended by a Bethel history student who had taken a similar excursion. 
That exposure to Poland and the people I met at the time motivated me to want to learn more of the country's experience and kept me going back until today. In 1982, I returned this time to a nation under martial law after the government had put down Solidarity, the first independent labor union in the communist East, East Bloc, and imprisoned its leaders. Again, it was a sense of adventure and curiosity, not so far afield from that of the prankster, that led me to want to understand what might be going on beneath the surface of this repressive society. How did people have enough to eat when the store shelves were virtually empty, I wondered? Why was private behavior so very different from public life? Why did they know more about Faulkner and Hemingway than the average American, although not the average Bethel College student, it seemed, even while being officially discouraged from studying America at all? The 1980s in Poland were, for me, a laboratory in life's fundamentals. I watched how the woman with whom I rented a room, from whom I rented a room in Warsaw, maneuvered difficult circumstances. She had survived a Soviet Siberian labor camp as a young teenager and later joined the Communist Party. I saw that she was equally adept at handling the police who came to search our apartment and the dissidents and activists in the emerging de democratic system. The same sense of wonder led me to want to understand what was bubbling up from below the surface in the late 1980s when Glasnost and Perestroika permeated the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall came down. During this period, I found myself again in Poland, and this brings me back to pranks. The upending of a political and economic system results in people playing with the rules en masse and creating new rules of the game. The aftermath of the collapse of the communist regimes of Eastern Europe was no different. Instant millionaires were made as new rules, or lack thereof, of capitalism were introduced. People who had worn suits only at their weddings suddenly became cabinet members in the new government. I witnessed one such acquaintance in his new offices in 1990. He had gone virtually overnight from being a dissident and the editor of a Catholic in intelligentsia publication to the deputy minister of the interior, the equivalent of our FBI. His spacious new office, complete with balcony, Persian rug, and fresh strawberries on offer, contrasted sharply with his old one at the Catholic paper, which was which was cramped and sparse. The very first thing he did as deputy minister, he told me, was to ask for his own dossier, his own FBI file, if you will, from his staff. These were the very people who had been in charge of spying on him and dissidents like him under the old regime. The file could not be located, his staff told him. During this period, I observed the arrival to the region of waves of congressional delegations, business scouts, and foreign aid-funded advisors. Foreign advisors, some of whom were overseeing millions of dollars in Western technical aid, were supposed to help the region make the transition to a market economy. The encounters that I witnessed between foreign advisors on the one hand and local elites whom I had known for many years on the other prompted me to want to know more about how this story would play out. These advisors were, of course, operating in an environment where new rules were being invented, and sometimes inventing them themselves. Curiosity motivated me to follow the aid story over 10 years as it unfolded. Some of my writings and critiques of American foreign aid and its advisors have attracted controversy and sometimes even, ex even the, the ire of powerful people whose activities I have exposed. And this brings me to another essential element of pranks that I've tried to employ, teamwork. I have found common ground with people from many walks of life and professions, investigative journalists, government researchers, analysts and scholars from a variety of disciplines. 
I've gained a lot of support from them by cultivating and collaborating with a like-minded, albeit diverse, community. My graduate students, many of whom have military backgrounds and careers, are part of this. Lately, I've turned my attention more to studying the United States, in particular, the privatization of American foreign policy and some of the elites who have helped privatize it. They can be seen as pranksters in their own right, recognizing the arbitrariness of the rules of the game and finding ways to get around them. I am also studying how the work of American federal government is cr increasingly carried out by private companies. Some of these, co some of these companies are testing time-honored rules about how government policies are supposed to be accountable to the public. For example, companies like Blackwater, which has been in the news for its Wild West-style police work in Iraq, are doing a rapidly rising portion of government work. Despite the conduct of some of its Baghdad-based employees, Blackwater is getting more, not less, business. The company manages to do this because it, too, has recognized and unfortunately exploited the changing nature of the rules. The world you are entering is one in which many of the old practices are falling by the wayside and new ones are being implemented, often on the fly. A friend I talked to about this speech advised me to make it short and give them one pearl of wisdom. So here's the pearl. Remember in life to keep that sense of curiosity, adventure, and playing with the rules of life's game. But also honor the rules when they deserve to be honored. And employ teamwork. Nourish relationships with like-minded people engaged in similar struggles. Oh, and one more thing now that you've graduated from Bethel. Meet sales quotas, give good customer service, especially if I'm on the other end of the line, wear hard hats, and clean up the lunchroom. Thank you. <laughs>